Hi, I'm Rob Cosm. Welcome to my shop. In this video, Dovetails by Hand, Sawing Tips and Tricks. That's what we're going to cover. That's what I teach all of my students. If you want to be able to cut dovetails like that, you've got to master the sawing skills. And that's what I'm going to show you. It's the very thing I teach all of my students. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. I was thinking about this the other day. I taught my first dovetail class over 30 years ago. And in that time, I have taught hundreds, if not thousands of classes. And I know I've taught several thousand students how to do this. Now, my mentor taught me that you assemble the joint right from the saw. There is no need for a test fit. You shouldn't have to go in there and pair the sides of your pins or your tails. You should be able to take it right from the saw. And what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to give you some lessons that will enable you to eventually put that saw right on the line, make that cut, and not have to touch it afterwards. That's the way it should be done. In fact, one of my mentors was once asked about tilting the tailboard to make the angled cuts. And he said, if you've got to tilt the tailboard, you need a sawing lesson. And that's what I'm going to give you. When we're done, you're going to be able to go out to the shop, put that saw on the line, make it start exactly where you want, and end up with a smooth, flat surface that is ready to be joined to the opposite piece. This is not difficult. If you have the right tool, and willing to put a little bit of practice in and follow some good technique, anybody can do this and do it well. Now you can't talk dovetails without talking about saws and I'm going to talk about that for a fair bit because you need to understand what to look for. By the way, we recently did a video covering the entire process of cutting dove through dovetails and if you haven't seen that we'll leave the link in the, in the description down below but today it's just on the sawing process now I've had numerous saws over my 30 plus years of doing this and this is all I seem to have left right now but I want to go through and I want to talk about what's so important and I also want to explain what I'm frequently quoted as saying cutting the dovetail is 70 percent the saw 20% the technique and only 10% practice and of course everybody always gets all tied up in knots when I say that but let me prove it. I'm going to take a piece of hardwood. This is a piece of poplar and it looks to be about three quarters of an inch thick. And I'm going to come in about three quarters of an inch and I'm going to make a cut as deep as the saw will allow. And I'm not paying any particular attention to where I'm sawing or how I'm sawing. I'm just letting the saw do its thing. Now I'm going to cut that piece off. So your saw on its own should produce a flat smooth surface which is the two critical ingredients to a good glue joint. So when you put that back together you should be able to put it back together in such a way that you can't even see the joint. And we can spin it around so as not to match grooves. So now when the side of your tail and the side of your pin come together that is a good glue joint. It's flat and it's nice and smooth. That is a function of the saw. So, how do you get there? Well, I've gone the Japanese route. Great saws, except that little thin blade has a tendency to wander in western hardwoods. For soft, very light woods, sure. But for robust western hardwoods of any substantial thickness, you're going to find that it's going to leave you wanting more. There's some antiques. Not everybody has access to them. They're limited. A lot of them saws today have a file handle or a round handle. The biggest problem with that is it's not very stout and it doesn't give you any registration. What I mean is this. If you pick up a pistol grip saw, that will register. And by the way, it's always a three finger grip. Index finger lays here and it gives stability to the saw. Every time you pick it up, it's going to register in your hand the exact same way. The advantage of that is you start to benefit from where knowing where plumb is, where 10 degrees to the right is, 10 degrees to the left because it's locked into your hand. A round handled saw, you don't have that. You're always having to watch the line. So right away I'm going to say the round handled saws are out if you're looking for all the advantages that you can muster 
from just the equipment, meaning the saw. The antiques are great if you can find them, but if you can't, well, what are you going to do? All right, what's so unique about this saw? Well, put a piece of wood in here and I'll show you some things. There's two things that you have to be able to do with the dovetail saw. Number one is start it accurately. It's no good if it jumps around on you and it ends up a sixteenth of an inch away from your line. You may as well use a chainsaw if that's going to happen. So you have to have complete control over the starting of the cut. Well, on this particular saw, I put little tiny teeth on the first two inches. That's what the 22 stands for. 22 points or teeth per inch. And they have a negative, about a negative 25, 30 degree cutting face. And the, with that cutting face back like that, when you're pushing the saw through the wood, it rides over it and it doesn't bite. That allows you to get that little groove, which is just enough to help track the saw so that when the big teeth come along and engage, they're already held in place and they'll give you all the speed that you need for a good adequate cut. You want to have appropriate amount of set. The set refers to the fact that each tooth is bent. It's either bent to the left or to the right. And first tooth bent to the left, next tooth bent to the right. And that's how it goes down, all the way down the blade. And be, by having those teeth slightly bent out from the saw plate, it creates a kerf or a groove that is a little bit wider than the saw blade itself. If you didn't have that, it would bind. In fact, you wouldn't get in there more than a sixteenth of an inch and it would get stuck. If you have too much set, what happens is you get a wide kerf and the blade wobbles back and forth. And not only do you have to saw, but you also have to steer. You don't want to have to do the steering. That part is up to the saw. Once you start that on a given path, it's going to continue and it should saw perfectly straight. Now, let's define straight. Shortest distance between two points. So, if we put a straight edge on that cut, we should see a nice straight saw curve. And the nice thing about a straight saw curve is it produces a flat surface and you've got to have that. Now you, the user, have to learn to aim the saw, which is the reason why I brought up how important it is to have a pistol grip so that every time you make a saw cut, you're reinforcing muscle memory, if you want to call it that, where plumb is or where 10 degrees to the left or 10 degrees to the right. Now, I use 10 degrees because that's the slope that I think looks the best on a dovetail. Weight. Now, here's a saw that I really like belonged to a friend of mine's father who happened to be a, a, a World War II vet. I like it, but it's very, very light. And when you get into hardwoods, you'll really notice that light saw is very difficult to control, has a tendency to want to skip around. If you get some weight into your saw, very much like woodworking equipment, weight helps dampen vibration. This saw in particular weighs about 22 ounces or almost double what the average dovetail saw weighs. And you'll find it really works in your favor. Just the weight of the saw is all you need for downward pressure. And by the way, when you're sawing, you want to use all of the available teeth. That's going to preserve or extend the life of the sharpening. If you're working with just a couple of inches in the middle, it won't be long and that's dull. If you use all of this, multiply how long it took to dull that by how long it's going to take to dull that and you'll see how much extra life you're going to get out of your saw. You want a pistol grip, three finger open pistol grip. You want weight, it's going to be in your favor. I don't like to have a deep saw. You'll find some dovetail saws have a lot of blade. Here's what I dislike about that. The farther away the tooth line is from the heavy brass back, the more unstable it's going to be. And if you consider that most of your dovetails are going to be cut in three quarter inch or less wood, then why do you need two and a half inches depth of cut? So narrow blade, more stable. The less set, the better. Now you have to have some. If you only had a thou, you're probably going to find it's going to bind. Three thou, four thou, it's starting to get it to the point where it's going to make that surface rough. The reason being is because those points stick out like that as you're sawing, they're scratching or raking the sides of the kerf and that's going to show up when you're done. And the rougher that is, 
the less pretty that, or that less clean that joint is going to be. I use two thou set, and for relative terms, a piece of writing paper is four thousandths of an inch. So if you were to split that piece of paper, that's how much set you have on either side. And what that's going to do, and there's, there's a slight disadvantage, although it really isn't when you think about it, when you start, you're now committed. You can't go part way down and try to make a correction, which would be impossible to mate to anyway, so that has to be straight, regardless of whether or not it's at 10 degrees or five degrees. The tooth count, as I told you up here, just for starting purposes, we're using 22. 15 teeth per inch seems to be just about right when it comes to aggressive, fast cutting, but controllable. The bigger the teeth, the more they're gonna to wanna to bite into the wood. If you're too fine, it takes too long, gets impatient. And if you're cutting something that's 20 inches wide out of hard maple, and you're having to make 40 or 60 strokes per side, you're gonna be exhausted halfway through. All of those things added up and put into one saw is going to make it so that you'll be able to get this down a lot sooner than you would think. You gotta have the right equipment. Experiment based on what I told you and find what works best for you. Let's talk body mechanics and I've heard others discount this, but I think it's important. I think you need everything in your favor to make this as positive an experience as possible and get you to the point where you can cut these dovetails the way you want as soon as you want. Well, first of all, I got a piece of poplar in here. I would consider that a medium density hardwood and I'm gonna swap it out for a piece of very soft pine. Why? Well, I think you should start practicing on something that allows you to focus on your technique without having to develop the muscle to push this off through a hard wood. Poplar, pardon me, pine, basswood, anything that's nice and soft. Uh, I always make sure that the board is sitting low in the vise. If it's up here, it's gonna vibrate, which is uncomfortable. So I keep it low, just a couple inches off the vise, off of the surface of the bench. And I also wanna make sure that it's standing plumb. This will reinforce your muscle memory so you know where plumb is, where you're 10 degrees to the right and 10 degrees to the left. Remember that pistol grip and the advantage it produces? Well, it only works if the board is standing plumb. Okay, you need a good stable stance. So I call this my uh, three-point stance. My feet are usually a little wider than shoulder width apart, a little bend in the knee. And if you were to measure that, I'm probably about 15 degrees off the face of the vise. My third point is going to be my hand holding onto the board. So if you think of the milking stool with its three legs, no matter how uneven the barn floor is, those three legs will all provide a nice stable platform. Add a fourth leg and you're always gonna have them rocking. So a tripod or a milking stool, nice and stable. So one, two, three. Now, you wanna keep that elbow close to your side but underneath your shoulder. So. Looking from straight on, if I were to draw a line, I could start at the end of the saw, go through my wrist, to my elbow, my shoulder, would be one nice line. Think of the piston on an old locomotive. Now in order to do that, you've got to turn your body a little bit, bend a little bit at the waist, so that that elbow drops right underneath that shoulder. If you've got your elbow out here, you're never going to be a very good sawyer. You need to bring that in and let that swing like a pendulum right underneath your shoulder. So we get in position, set that in place, nice light grip. Probably the single biggest problem that new sawyers deal with is when, until they've trained the muscles back up in here, they overcompensate out here by squeezing the life out of that. And you have to learn to really relax that. You only want to hold it. I often use the example of cradling a baby's hand. Just hold it tight enough to maintain or keep it from dropping onto the floor. So nice light grip, three finger as we mentioned, elbow right underneath the shoulder, three point stance, and now you're ready to start sawing. Now I'm working under the assumption that you have a good vise that securely holds your board. If you don't have this style of vise, you may have to put another piece of wood on the opposite side to prevent your vise from racking because you do not want that board to be moving around on you. Now, I always, I'm, I'm gonna suggest 
that the most important thing be that you be able to start accurately. So before you draw any lines on there, you want to just get to a point where you can get that saw to start with greatest of control. So I always create an anchor point. That's done with my opposite index finger and thumb. And I squeeze the wood, but I squeeze with the bottom third of each digit. If you squeeze down too low, the point of your finger and the point of your thumb are going to be right in line with the set of the teeth and as you're moving it forward and back you're going to cut them. So to avoid that, bring that thumb up, bring the index finger up. Now the point is above the set of the teeth and you're protected from cutting them. Keep this finger pulled back by the way. So there we go. Now I'm going to take my saw and I'm going to apply some light lateral pressure by pushing against my fingers and the finger and thumb being anchored, that saw cannot skirt to the right or to the left. It's held in a track. If I need to make some adjustment, I can simply push by inch inchworming my finger and thumb like this to move that saw into position. Very, very light grip. If you have a saw with the starter teeth, at this point all you want to do is just move that forward and back until you get enough of a groove that you can catch your thumbnail in it. At that point, you move to the big teeth and start to cut. Don't need to go very deep in this early phase. You just want to practice starting. If you don't have starter teeth, you've got to add another level of complexity to this. And what I teach folks to do, or used to, is lift, take about 80% of the weight of the saw off of the wood so that the teeth are just barely kissing it. Again, what you're trying to do is just get that little groove started that you can then allow the saw to start cutting aggressively. By the way, I always wipe the sawdust off so when, they, when I set my saw back down on here, the sawdust doesn't fall and obscure my line. Make multiple attempts at starting that saw. You don't want it to jump around. Remember, index finger and thumb create the anchor point. Light lateral pressure prevents it from skirting off to the right. Finger and thumb keep it from going to the left. And just go in there and practice until 10 out of 10, it starts exactly where you want. Remember to use the full length of the blade so that you get full life out of the sharpening of your saw. Now believe it or not, the very first thing you're going to do is the most critical process of the dovetail and that is getting that saw cut perpendicular to the board when cutting the tails. So I'm going to do a series of lines and I'm careful to make sure that those lines are accurate. If you're going to follow your line, you better make sure that line's in the right spot. I prefer red simply because it's easier to see, especially on dark woods. Pinch, index finger and thumb. Now what you're going to notice is, as you do a little bit of this, you're going to develop what I call a natural sawing groove. Here's what I mean. I have the saw in my hand, I come over here, my stance is correct, I grab the wood, I let set the saw down and it falls into my natural sawing groove. Now if I'm not parallel to the line, I have two options. I can correct it by moving my arm and start sawing, but my body's going to want to go back to where it was. So rather than make the correction up here, I'm going to pay attention to what I assume is my natural sawing groove and I'm going to adjust with my feet, bringing my body around until that blade of the saw lines up with that line on my board. Now I'm reinforcing my body's natural sawing groove and I should be able to get this just right. Here's what I'm going to do. Pinch, press the saw laterally, push back into position, I'm sawing on the left side of that line. All I should see to the right of the blade is just line. I don't want to see wood in line. I don't want to see part of a line. I want to see all of the line. Remind myself of a nice light grip. Maintain some lateral pressure. Little pass to get the kerf started and then continue. Now, you don't have to go very deep because once you've started that gotten that deep, you're already committed. I'm going to take my six inch square. This is the one I use as my rule. 
Make sure that the blade is in there so it's not interfering or throwing off your accuracy. Referencing from the back side, my rule is that when you're cutting dovetails, as long as your saw blade is within an eighth of an inch over six inches, you're probably going to be okay. So keeping the square tight to the inside face, I'll slide that over until it touches the blade somewhere. Now at that point I look and I'm out less than a sixteenth of an inch. Well that is well within spec. Okay, let's do it again. Only this time, because we have to be able to learn to saw on both the left side and the right saw, right side, I'm going to go to the other side of the, of the line. Now you'll also notice that I've got to move my thumb because if I do it like this, I can't see the, blade, the line. So I pull my thumb back, but I use it to help anchor my index finger. Now you can also kind of curl that finger a little bit so that you're running off your nail instead of your finger if your skin is a little bit sticky. But same as before, I'm applying light lateral pressure. This time I'm looking on the left side of the blade with my saw on the right side of the line. I want to make sure that all I see is just saw a, a red line, no wood. Light lateral pressure. Use those little teeth to get it started or take the weight. And like before, put the square on there and check it. Now that one's out a little bit more, but it's still under an eighth of an inch, so I'm fine. Now what I would have my students do is continue to do this all the way down. Saw on one side of the line. You don't have to go very deep. Check it for square. Saw on the opposite side of the line. What that also does is forces you to saw nice and straight because when you make a saw cut out here, there's lots of support on both sides of the blade to keep that saw going nice and straight. But when you start removing material from one side to the other, there's no longer any support out there and that forces you to keep a nice straight sawing line. By the time you've gone through a couple of rows of sawing on both sides, you'll probably find that you're getting nice perpendicular cuts. And as you watch the video we did on sawing dovetails, you'll soon realize that perpendicular cut is the make or break to a dovetail. Be patient. Try to get every one perfect. Don't worry about plum. What we're focusing on first is getting a good square cut on the end of the board. Keep the sawdust clear. And I would suggest that you stop and check after every cut. Put the square, make sure there's no debris in here that's going to influence how the square lays against the board. And go until you can get them perfect. I'm still out less than a sixteenth, but it's not going to matter by the time we come down to a three quarter inch piece. Now we're going to work on making the plumb cuts and the angled cuts. So since in real practice or real use, you're going to have to have stop at the gauge line. I'm going to suggest that you put a gauge line on there with your marking gauge now. You may as well practice going down to the line. Folks get all worried about the angle of their tails. Well, that's actually not critical. Although it does play a big role in the aesthetics of the joint, mechanically, the tailboard is the template. And as long as the second piece, being the pin board, fits into that template, the tailboard, the joint is going to work. But we'll give you some practice on how to get those just the way you want them. So we're going to draw some lines. We'll work on the angled ones first. I'm going to make a series of lines across the end of the board and going from the gauge line up. Don't let your line run below. Why? Sooner or later, you're going to follow that line and end up cutting below when you really didn't want to. I'm going to go a little less than an eighth of an inch apart. Again, making nice accurate lines. And do multiples. I would suggest you go all the way across the board. And since we have to cut both sides. By the way, I also find it 
advantageous to start at the gauge line instead of trying to stop at it. Almost running out of ink. Okay. When you're making a plum cut, you have to start with the saw plum. You cannot start and then alter. When you're making an angled cut, the only difference is you still need to be perpendicular, but you're going to have your blade already at that prescribed angle. So figure out where it is. You may not get it right the first few times, but that's why after multiple cuts, you can make slight adjustments. At this point, I just guess and I seem to get it right. I'm cutting on the right side of the line, so I've got my thumb pulled back. Index finger is supporting the blade. Lateral pressure, line it up so all I see is the blade. I have my saw at what I think is the appropriate 10 degree angle. Use all the blade and stop at the baseline. Just so happens that one was right. Wipe the sawdust clear, go in and do it again. Line it up so you see nothing but line. Now, if I was off, let's say I was a little bit too shallow, then on the next one, I would try to make a angle that blade a little bit more. If it's too much, then I'd back it off. But you just want to keep practicing all the way across the board until you're getting your saw cuts at the angle you want. And again, more importantly, you're perpendicular across the end. Now don't forget, you also have to cut the other side. So in this case, which is, by the way, my strong side, I have both finger and thumb behind the blade. I get great view of the line and I've got wonderful support behind the blade with both index finger and thumb. Light grip, angle that blade at what you think it should be. Careful to stop at the line. Sawdust clear. Now that one's off a little bit, so I'm gonna tilt it a little bit more. And I would keep on going. You'd be surprised how little practice it will take before you'll get that right. But you have to nail the perpendiculars across the end first. Get that, the rest of it's a piece of cake. All right, our last exercise applies to the pin board. So, like with the tail board, you're going to have to stop at a gauge line. So I'm going to go ahead and put one in now on both sides, inside and out and back. By the way, you always want to cut your dovetail so that the face, in this case I would have written, written pin board on there, you always cut from the face side. Put your board in the vise. Make sure it's standing plumb. Also make sure that it's low in the vise so again it doesn't vibrate. Now in this case, I'm going to use perpendicular cuts across the uh, lines across the face and plumb cuts, I'm sorry, across the end, plumb cuts down the face. Keep them a little less than an eighth of an inch apart. Remember to stop at the gauge line, only draw where you want to saw. Go all the way across the board. I'll do a few more just so we can practice both sawing on the left side, sawing on the right side. All right, when it comes to cutting pins, doesn't really matter what the angle is here, you're, still, you're simply following a line, but you have to get the plumb cuts right. Let me explain that because sometimes I don't think folks fully understand it. So the walnut piece are my pin cuts. If these pin cuts are not plumb, plumb means parallel to the side, perpendicular to the earth would be a better explanation. Plumb and parallel. If we were to have any slope on these two cuts, that means this pin would either be narrower at the bottom or wider. Either way, it's either going to create a wedge and split something, or it's going to be narrower and create a gap. These are critical. So, we have to get that right. This is where that pistol grip really helps because it will reinforce with every cut your natural ability to make a plumb cut. The other nice thing about a heavy saw is gravity is a great trainer for where perpendicular or plumb is. 
one of the reasons why I always make sure my board is standing plumb. So good stance, hold the board. I'm going to work on the left side of the mark. All I see is line. Get it started with those little teeth or if you don't have that, light touch, meaning you've got about 20% of the weight of the saw off of the wood until it gets started. Now, eyeball that line. Light grip and do your best. Get a nice plumb cut. You'll, after multiple cuts, you'll see that you're drifting. And most folks are going to drift consistently to one side or the other. Rarely have I ever had a student who would drift to the left on one cut and the right on the next. They always seem to be going in one direction consistently or the other. So if I had drifted off to my left, then what's happened is I've got to reset what I think was plumb. I was sitting like this, the blade was actually tilted, but I thought it was plumb. So in my head, I'm going to say, okay, if that's what I thought was plumb, I'm going to correct it. But you know what? In correcting it, you probably won't go far enough. So I'll correct, and then I'm going to allow myself to actually overcorrect. Now I'm actually thinking I'm going too far the other way. But what, what you'll end up finding out more times than not is that that will be the plumb cut. You may have to do this every day. For several days before you get it consistent each time. And to save wood, just kidding, cut on the other side to practice sawing on the other side of the line. And see if you can't go down there and leave just those little splinters of wood that adjust the thickness of your pencil or your pen. And believe it or not, that's all there is to it, to sign fantastic dovetails. Your saw is the critical tool, and it does not take a lifetime of practice to get it right. If you have a saw that will cut a perfectly straight line, you only have to learn to aim it so that it will go in the direction that you want. Uh, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said, better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.